Hello, everyone. I'm Anj Bomber, and I'm a senior here at Burlington High School. I've been a part of the TED Ed Club here at BHS, headed by Ms. Sheffer, for the last two years. My first TED Ed or TED like talk was on antibiotic resistance. This official TEDx talk will be on further exploring this topic of antibiotic resistance, but I will also introduce a scientific solution to this problem of antibiotic resistance. So, many of you may be thinking, what exactly is antibiotic resistance? The best way to understand this concept is to imagine a scenario. So, imagine you're sick. You go to your doctor, who then diagnoses you with strep throat. He then prescribes antibiotics to cure you of your illness. However, you come back two weeks later because the antibiotics were ineffective. They didn't work. You still have strep throat after two weeks. Let me remind you that if strep throat goes untreated, it has a potential to be fatal. Such diseases do exist today. Hopelessness, helplessness, frustration. Patients with these untreatable bacterial diseases feel these emotions because they are quite literally doomed, as they cannot be treated by any antibiotic known to man. These diseases are on the rise today, caused by incredible yet fearful bacteria known as superbugs. Superbugs are basically bacteria that are resistant to every antibiotic that we have on the market. Specifically, there are approximately two million people here in the United States each year that are affected by resistant bacteria, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So, the next question we have to examine is, how do these bacteria become so powerful? How are they able to defeat every single antibiotic that we have here? Well, the answer begins simply with natural selection. So, first, let's take an original bacterial population, right here at the top. Now, this original population has a varying amount of resistance per the colony or per bacteria. So, here we have yellow, and yellow represents, on the scale here, a low resistance level. So, yellow basically means that this bacteria is, doesn't have any resistance to the antibiotic. In other words, this yellow bacteria doesn't have the gene or genes that allow it to be resistant to antibiotics. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the red, the red bacteria. Now, that is highly resistant to these antibiotics. So, in essence, if we introduce an antibiotic, let's say this first population is on your hand, and if we introduce this population, uh, if we introduce an antibiotic to this population, what ends up happening is the low resistant bacteria obviously get eliminated because they're not resistant to the antibiotic that you've introduced on your hand. But these highly resistant bacteria, they remain there because they are resistant. They have the genes that allow them to be resistant to the antibiotic that you introduced. So then over time, these red bacteria proliferate and they create a final population of highly resistant bacteria to this antibiotic. So let's say you take this antibiotic again and you apply it to your hand, whatever it is. It won't work, because this, this final population is resistant. So this process of natural selection is where it all starts. But since these resistant genes, these genes that code for resistance, are so favorable from a bacterium's perspective, they're spread through the processes of transformation, transduction, and conjugation. Now, these three words, these three processes will not be explored in depth. But all we need to understand is that these three processes allow bacteria to share their genes, to share their resistant genes. So let's take this red bacteria right here. Let's say this yellow bacteria travels down all the way here, whatever it is, and it's right next to this red bacteria. This red bacteria, this highly resistant bacteria, can share its resistant genes with the yellow low resistant bacteria. So all of a sudden, now we have two resistant bacteria. So in that way, these genes can be spread. So humans have undeniably hastened this selection and sharing process of resistant genes by overusing and misusing antibiotics, causing an exponential increase in the amount of superbugs that we have today. Superbugs are resistant to every antibiotic that we have. Another problem that we have that contributes to antibiotic resistance 
is pharmaceutical companies. Now, these pharmaceutical companies are not producing antibiotics. Why? Why aren't they producing antibiotics? Simply because such an endeavor results in a monetary net loss, compelling these pharmaceutical companies to instead switch their focus on other profitable medical conditions such as cancer and other terminal illnesses. So basically, these pharmaceutical companies aren't producing these antibiotics because they lose money. So from a pure business standpoint, they would focus on things that would make them money, like cancer and terminal illnesses, where they keep、uh, gaining some profit. So as a result of these two factors, first being humans overusing and misusing antibiotics, second being these pharmaceutical companies not producing antibiotics, scientists argue that we are entering or have already entered the post-antibiotic age, an era marked by our antibiotics becoming ineffective. A period marked by the victory of superbugs. Fortunately for us, there's a feasible and cost-effective solution: phage therapy. Phage therapy involves the use of bacteriophages or viruses that infect specific species of bacteria. So, through phage therapy, we have these viruses, and these viruses. Infect their bacterial host and eventually kill them. So scientists can use this can use this method to cure patients of their bacterial diseases without using antibiotics. Now, over the past few decades, Western scientists have overlooked this method. We've been continually using these antibiotics because we have them. And ever since penicillin was created, we've been going crazy on these antibiotics. We've been using so many that the resistance has become incredible. But now we need a new approach. But what's even more interesting is that this process of phage therapy has been in use in Russia and Eastern Europe since the 1920s, and they've successfully science have success, scientists have successfully treated patients using phage therapy without antibiotics. So, because an antibiotic isn't used, obviously the bacteria can't become resistant to an antibiotic if you don't use it. So now let's just explore how exactly phage therapy works and how it can be a solution to this problem. So we have a relatively simple diagram here, but it gets the point across. So here we have this square. We're going to start right here. This square is the bacteria. Right on top of that is the virus. Now within this square we have this, this circle. This circle represents the bacteria's bacterium's genome. Its DNA. The thing that codes for its proteins, that codes for everything that it does. Now, the virus, what it starts with, it, it attaches onto the bacterial cell with whatever method it may use, and it injects this red line. This, this is the virus's genetic information. It's usually RNA. So, once it's once the virus's genetic information is injected into the bacterial cell, what ends up happening is that if you see here, the Bacterial genome enlarges; the the plasmid enlarges, and the virus's RNA gets incorporated into the bacteria's DNA. And what we see here is that its complete makeup has changed. So now, what does this little red line, this this RNA strand or DNA strand, do to the bacteria? Well, it's genetic information, so it forces the bacteria to do something that it wasn't originally intended to do. So this virus, once it Has its genetic material incorporated it into the bacteria's genome, it then forces the bacterial cell to produce components of this virus, and then over time, these components assemble together to create a fully formed virus or viruses within the cell. Now, over time, after there's obviously not enough room, these viruses force the cell to lyse or burst, releasing more copies of the virus. This process is so specific in that it only can infect, it can only attack each bacteriophage can only affect certain strains of bacteria. Of bac each bacteriophage can only affect certain strains of bacteria. So now we should take a look at the consequences. But most definitely, the positive consequences of phage therapy outweigh the negatives, as the cons of this method are, are relatively minor. Through Locke, Carillo, and Abendin's research, which I'll be using through the rest of my talk, we see the benefits of phage therapy. So first, bacteriophages have the ability to auto-dose. 
So in that sense, what I mean by that is that bacteriophages can accumulate where most needed. Where are they most needed? Where, there's a high, where, there, where there is the highest concentration of bacteria. So let's just take you know, a scenario. We have this outline of a human body here. Let's say you have a bacterial infection and it occurs in the right side of your body, like right around here. Now, if you, take, if you inject bacteriophages into the left side of your body, those bacteriophages will eventually find their way onto the right side of the body and stay in that area, not affecting your neck, not affecting the lower half of your body. Antibiotics, on the other hand, they cannot do this. They affect the entire body, accounting for what we know as side effects. Second, vi these viruses, these bacteriophages, are relatively simple. They're only made up of nucleic acids and proteins, thereby giving them a low toxicity in that they have no ma major adverse effect on the human body, whereas antibiotics, they disrupt normal bodily functions, which cause the side effects that we see today. On top of that, these bacteriophages don't affect the healthy bacteria that's within our body. They only affect the unwanted and foreign bacteria that they're intended to affect, whereas antibiotics, again, aren't able to do this. On top of all of that, phage resistance is virtually non-existent relative to antibiotic resistance, as it's much harder for a bacteria to evolve and become resistant to phages than it is to antibiotics. Furthermore, phage therapy has a low economic impact. Bacteriophages are relatively cheap compared to developing new antibiotics. So as I said earlier, these pharmaceutical companies are facing these, these huge losses when they develop antibiotics. So if they start using bacteriophages, they will not only cure this problem of antibiotic resistance, but they will also make some money. Now, it came out a little blurry, but that's OK. These are a bunch of tablets right here. So bacteriophages, they have the ability to um, you only have to take one single dose of a bacteriophage. So if you're a patient with an untreatable bacterial disease or any bacterial disease, strep throat, whatever it may be, you only have to take one dose of a bacteriophage. Why? Because viruses are self-replicating, as we saw in that cycle. They replicate themselves. Whereas when you take antibiotics, you have to take, oftentimes you have to take heavy and frequent dosages, which will also help address you know, the monetary issue. On top of all that, Bacteriophages can be administered in a variety of forms, from liquid to tablet, etc., whereas antibiotics don't have this sort of flexibility. So, there are a few cons of this method, but one con, one main con, is that these, these bacteriophages, they act, they act as like specific guided missiles. Antibiotics are similar to a nuclear bomb that wipes out everything, as Dr. John Ray once said. But bacteriophages are guided missiles. Now, the problem with a guided missile is that oftentimes the guided missile has a pre-programmed target. Now, if you want to change that target, you've got to get a whole new guided missile. In that same way, bacteriophages are like that kind of a guided missile. And if you, for each specific bacterial disease, you've got to have a different bacteriophage. And that can be a problem because you've got to find them out in nature. We haven't found a way to synthetically produce them yet. So that is one of the main scientific cons. However, the most significant con of this method is Western medicine's unfamiliarity with phage therapy. But this unfamiliarity can be readily overcome by increased awareness and application throughout the Western scientific world. So overall, as we verge near the post-antibiotic era, phage therapy may prevent the victory of what we know as superbugs. Finally, organizations across the globe are looking at this issue of antibiotic resistance, including the Center for Disease Control and the Alliance for the Prudent Use of Antibiotics. But now the only question that remains is, will these organizations overcome the scientific ignorance of the past and turn to these viral soldiers to, to defeat these bacterial diseases? Thank you.